See, the first thing that I have been told uh, is the time limit. And uh, that I think is completely unfair. <laughs> because I'm, by force of habit, I speak for two hours nonstop. And don't let anyone else speak. But thank you very much. Uh, coming to the India Foundation was lucky for me when I left Times Now in 2016. Right a few days after quitting Times Now, even when the name Republic had not been given, I came to Goa to the India Foundation Conference. And I got so much love. I got so much love. I had put my life savings of 30 lakh rupees together and decided to launch a TV network to take on the biggest media house of this country. That's all I had. And at that conference, I had no investment, nothing planned. At that conference, everyone came to me, shook my hand, hugged me, and said, it is going to be possible. Go ahead and do it. I got so much love in Goa. Believe me, magic has happened after that. So the first thing I want to say here is big thank you to the India, to the India Foundation, to the love that you've given me. Today, today, that same network that started from a 700 square feet co-shared space in Mumbai reaches approximately 16 to 20 crore viewers every week and we are not even counting digital. This is only possible if you give me unparalleled love. So first of all, very, very grateful for that. I have five points I want to share with you today. And I do hope that this becomes some food for thought at this conference. What we need to do today, when you say from roots you rise to conquer the world, we don't need to be self-deprecating, but it is time to be honestly self-critical. We must not be in an echo chamber where we tell ourselves we are the best, we were the best, and we shall continue to be the best. The moment you do, if you're a friend, and I hope we are friends in this room, I say the best friend is someone who can look at you in the eye and tell you where you're going wrong. And I think... Therefore, I say, let's do some honest self-assessment. I have five points to make, and I will end by telling you what I'm going to do for it. The first point I want to make is this. It is time to be confident of our own narrative. It is time to stop constantly seeking the endorsement of the West. Constantly. And I say this in the presence of the esteemed Dr. Jay Shankar. He, you know where I've come from. We've had a chat on this. Sir. It is time to stop constantly seeking the approval of those who will not give you approval, but who will get a sense of entitlement every time a country of 1.4 billion people comes to them and says, give us our space, endorse us, and certify us. Do we have the courage to say that we don't need their certification? Do we have the courage? That's right. So I say today... What happens? We overtake the United Kingdom and France. We become the fifth largest economy of the world. What did the New York Times say? They say India's falling economy sags further. And yet we go to them and say, give us your endorsement. We have moved, and uh, Mr. N.K. Singh referred to it. We have moved almost 300 million people out of poverty as per the UN Multidimensional Poverty Index, right? And we still seek the approval of the West that stereotypes us as a country of snake charmers. When we are making our place in the global story, we have to stop seeking the approval of the neo-colonial media whose aim is simply coercive culture imposition. Coercive culture imposition is not political imposition. Culture imposition means they want you to feel smaller so that your scale, Mr. Mahindra spoke of scale, you may be larger as an economy, be larger as a military, be larger as a society, you may be larger in terms of maybe one day innovations, but unless you have confidence in your own culture, 
and stop getting the approval of the West, things will not effectively change. And I, 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 do, I do feel today that, you know, when I, when I, I, was, I was the first generation, my friend Sanjeev and I went to college around the same time. We came out of college after the reform, Sanjeev, right? At that time, we were a country surviving on foreign aid. Some of us who went on scholarships to British universities came back and the most sought after job for those graduates from Oxford and Cambridge and King's College was to be in the office of the UK Foreign Aid Office in New Delhi. Today, we are trading with the UK on equal terms and we are larger than the UK as an economy. We are giving money to countries like Afghanistan. We're giving money to countries like Bangladesh. We cannot allow the Western media to label us as an intolerant India because that is happening with one intention, to prejudice our progress. So my first thought is, the fact is, our India story, I feel, is fundamentally very strong. We are 72 years of it. False notions of those unfamiliar or deliberately wanting to be unfamiliar with the India story must not, must not affect us. India cannot be ruled from a 2,000 square feet room near Pragati Maidan called the Foreign Correspondence Club. That's my first point. And I lead on now to my second point. We are too easily affected. My second point is, do we counter the calumny of lies? I was delighted, Mr. Foreign Minister, when yesterday, your very, very efficient spokesperson of the Ministry of External Affairs, Mr. Ravish Kumar, came and countered the calumny of lies at an XP division press conference. It doesn't usually happen. I was delighted about it because I believe that we as a country are very, very, very easily affected by the calumny of lies, by the constant prejudice of the West, almost looking for an external validation from these people. And for the longest time, we have allowed their misconception to precipitate and mark our conviction in the India story. We let media houses run by our colonizers like the BBC mock the Chandrayaan-2 mission even before its launch with cartoons where aliens were saying, Ajeev desh hai, kuch log chand tak aage aur kuch sadak par bhi thik se nahi chalte. This was a BBC Hindi cartoon. We kept quiet when the New York Times published editorials titled No Exceptions for a Nuclear India and asked the Obama administration to press for India to adhere to the standards of nuclear proliferation to which other nuclear nations adhere to, presuming India didn't already. What a presumption. What a presumption. We've seen how in 1995, and we are not learning from history, we've seen in 1995 an encounter between terrorists and Indian security forces, which ends with a fire engulfing Charare Sharif. BBC uses stills from the Chechnya incident to show the Indian operation in a bad light. You see, I'm not here to crib, but what I'm saying is we keep going back to an endorsement from the same people, and that is their worth. I went to the offices of Time Magazine in New York, 7,000 square feet office. We allow a country of 1.4 billion people whose aspirations are rising every day to have its position questioned by a dying organization of no value in the West, of 7,000 square feet, and what matters to us is the global power index coming out of that room. What a shame, what a shame. The point is that the time has come for India to counter and neutralize the lies spread by the Western media mavens to undo the preset, presumptuous, and untrue views it creates about our country. Last night on my program, I had a person from, I think, the Wilson Center called Michael Kugelman. He tweets every day about how India treats Muslims badly. I asked him two questions about the CAA. He was stuttering. There was no knowledge to base it, but there was confidence. We have the knowledge, we lack the confidence. I say it will start with self-assertion. <laughs> self-assertion. My third point is therefore, I am not, what have, what have we done? Like Mr. Mahindra says, we all contribute our bit. I want to tell you, we have contributed our bit. And when we contribute, we do so with all our heart, all our conviction, all our conviction. At the Republic Media Network, we reach 15 to 20 crore, 150 to 200 million Indians every day. 
Our mission is Rashtra ke naam. Our tagline is Nation First, No Compromise. Rashtra Sarvopari. And I felt so happy when despite all the odds on the 2nd of February, we launched Republic Bharat. 12 crore viewers on week three. And at that point of time, it was the time when unfortunately several Indian media houses joyously joined the campaign of the West after the Balakot strikes. I repeat, Indian media houses, our Jaichans are at home, our Mir Jafars are at home. And I say today that even yesterday, the unprintable facts on a website which produces an article which says that the Indian Air Force has been outgunned by the Pakistanis in the last one year. Do a Google search and you'll know who I'm talking about. These people joyously joined the expedition of the Western media houses to denigrate our own people. At that point of time, we coined a phrase. I like coining phrases. Three years back, three and a half years back, I coined a phrase on a show, it became a hashtag, and it did remarkably well, I must say. I'm so proud of it. It's called Tukde Tukde Gang. Somewhere around March, I'm glad, Mr. Foreign Minister, you've also had the occasion to use it recently. I commend you for it, sir. I stand with you, sir. But we also used another phrase called the Sabut Gang. Now, why do we use these phrases? Because sometimes complex arguments do not permeate to all people. We are told we simplify the news. We simplify the news to a metaphor in which the basic facts are understandable to the people. Because when we say Sabut Gang, and then we countered it with the footage, of the SPICE 2000 missiles which were used. So we effectively countered with facts a one-month campaign to say that the Indian government had lied about the Balakot strikes. I feel so ashamed of the media in India that joins this expedition. The point that I'm making today is, if we as a media house can do it, what if so many more of us do it? What if all of us tell ourselves that we are not a meek nation desperately trying to find its footing in the global order anymore, that we are an empowered nation and we have the capacity to produce an extremely powerful counter-narrative? And has the time not come today to not do it occasionally, for not one network to do it occasionally, but for the entire Indian media the people of this country to make it a constant and strong narrative. That is my question to you, which brings me to my third point tonight. Time is up, but I make, must make my third point. Challenge the global media hegemony. Challenge them in media and in think tanks. I will end with two examples. I do not believe that others can do it better than us. But there's one word we use very often in the media, it is reach, reach, reach. What in industry they call scale. For us in media, it is reach. When someone tells me, what is your purpose, or not? I say my purpose is that if I feel the value of my conviction, I must control your mind space, not your economic space, not your wallet, I don't want to muscle you, but I must have the capacity to influence you in my direction. I strongly believe the time has come for us to build that reach. UK, BBC, global audience of 426 million. When I was at Cambridge doing a fellowship, it was full of Chinese, and I asked them, why are you here? They said, our government has sent us here to know how a small island nation ruled the world. And truly, today, the BBC, one out of every 16 adults around the world reach, reads their absolutely adulterated news and consider it to be the truth, unfortunately. Now, we in the Indian media should rise beyond being treated as native informants to building networks of our own. 
I believe we can. And I'm going to make end with a prediction of when that is going to happen. So just give me two more minutes. Just two more minutes. The USA, Time Warner, Comcast, Walt Disney, News Corp. We need to cultivate media networks and make seek investments centered in India that challenge this media hegemony, curate the India story for the world instead of seeking space in their publications. When I started my organization, I told you I had no money. I was told I sat in a room when I had no money. When I had hired people, I sat in a room at the Western Hotel in Mumbai. And I was told, Arnab, how much money do you want? But just do one thing. Your company will be registered in Singapore. And it was a very difficult choice. I was told in a room, we'll give you 200 to 300 million dollars, no questions asked. But it has to be centered in Singapore. I want to tell you one thing. I did not even raise $10 million, but it was 100% Swadeshi. My company is based, registered in Mumbai. I pay taxes. I don't complain. I'm working hard for one day a company to rise from India that will counter these airwaves. Other countries are going global. Al Jazeera, Russia today, even China. I had more to say, but I don't want to expend my time. But in the presence of our foreign minister, I want to say this. People like Swapan Das Gupta, Ram Madhav, all of you, think about what our capacity as a country will be if we can do it. And I want to say one last thing. You know why I know we are going to do it? Because I promised you today, as I promised in 2016 in Goa, I said one year from now, I said it in the presence of Mr. Arun Puri and other worthies from the media. I said one year, and they didn't like it one bit. I said one year from now, I'm going to be the number one media news organization in television. Ladies and gentlemen, two years from now, maximum two years from now, Republic will be the first media organization from the soil of India to make sure that our flag is pitchforked in multiple global quarters. And I'll tell you how, at that time when I said this, they scoffed at me and they said it was ridiculous. I don't know how. My friend Sanjeev, I share many things with him. I told him that I don't know how. I don't know how, but something in my mind tells me we have three things on our side. We have the power of youth and we have an incredible understanding of technology. And the broadcast and digital medium needs technology. Finally, the world is flat for the first time. And I'm not inspired by Thomas Friedman. I am saying the world is flat because digitization in the world today reduces the cost of capital to an unbelievable fraction of what it used to be. So what do we need? We need dreams. We need talent. We need conviction. And more than anything else, we need to believe that our time has come. Our time has come. Two years we'll start. In five to ten years, I want to see in my professional life. I want to see. I hope that we together will see the country that became a software superpower. And by the way, the last and most unquestionable advantage we have is that we speak better English than anyone in the world. So we have language, youth, technology, belief, little bit of capital, and we will do it. We will, we will reverse colonize. How beautiful it will be. I love London. I'd love to colonize it again. <laughs> is that not the time? So I've, my time is up. Before he pushes me out, I'll say thank you to me. And please wish me the same amount of love, luck, and affection as you gave me three years back. Thank you. <laughs>